Good morning, everybody. Um, well, we all know how to do it, don't we? We've just seen Andre Varga. He's shown you that uh, video. It's easy, isn't it? You make a hole at the bottom, hole at the bottom. You slide the plate up. You make a hole at the top. Fire a few screws in. Bob's your uncle. Charlie's me aunt. End of the story. So you don't really need this at all. Well, maybe you do. Did you notice that screw? Yeah? The screw that was used to pull the plate onto the bone. And Andre said, will you angle that a bit? Did you see that? You angle it a bit and God, you tighten the screw up, it reduced. Easy, isn't it? Well, supposing you got the angle wrong. What would happen when you tightened it up? It might reduce if you got really lucky, but on the other hand, it might displace. So my first message is MEPO is not necessarily quite as easy as you might think. So this morning, we're going to look at what type of surgical approaches exist. What's the characteristic of a surgical approach and what are the critical features? And I think that there are really now three types of approaches which you use on a regular basis. We have the classic open approach, which we all love to do. That's really why we became surgeons. We have these percutaneous approaches, pinning wrists, putting external fixators on, and the more exciting and much more challenging minimal access surgery, of which you've just seen probably the simplest example. Do these approaches have anything in common? And the answer is yes. The first thing that you have to do, and this is the start of your planning, is to decide how to position your patients. You then need to know where to make the hole, because even a K-wire requires a small hole. And in order to know where to make the hole, you need some landmarks to help you decide. When you're using an open approach, we're going to use internervous planes, and I'll come on to this uh, very shortly. We want a layered dissection. We are surgeons. We are artists. We are craftsmen. We are these wonderful people. And none of us have ever seen a surgeon take a knife and go like this, have we? Well, actually, maybe we have, but maybe we shouldn't. We need to know about the dangers of our surgical approaches, because often the dangers are the things that you don't see. So let's start off. We'll look at the percutaneous approaches and say, what are the critical features? Well, the first thing is, if you're going to treat fractures percutaneously, either the fracture's reduced or you have to fix it, you have to reduce it without open surgery. If you can't do that, you can't do this purely uh, percutaneously. Normally, palpating the landmarks, which is the classical way, is not good enough. And therefore, almost certainly, you're going to need an image intensifier. And the dangers are there. The problem is you can't see them. Surgical extension, that bit, I'm in trouble. What do you do? Extend the incision. You can't do that with percutaneous. So here we've got one which most of the people in the room have done. Percutaneous fixation of the distal radius, either with an X-fix or more commonly with pins. And the problem, of course, is the superficial radial nerve. So if you are putting these pins in, this is not actually perfectly percutaneous. You have to make a small incision, separate out with an artery forcep, see that nerve, 
and make sure you don't hit it, because if you do this blind, you probably will. What would you call this? What's that? What would you call that? Yeah, it's a distal locking screw. It's a lateral to medial distal locking screw. You're wrong. It's a targeting device for the radial nerve. <laughs> you will, I promise you, be within eight millimeters of the radial nerve if you put this in blind. So basically, either do this by a dissection or use the AP hole, which is a lot safer. So the problem with percutaneous approaches are the dangers and your need to know anatomy is actually greater when you're using these approaches. Minimal access. Again, you have to have the fracture reduced or be able to do so. Again, you won't be able to palpate. You'll have to use imaging. We sometimes use a, a, a percutaneous, uh, an internervous plane, and we sometimes use dissection. Dangers are a big issue. Surgical extension is not possible. So here we have got the minimal access approach to the humerus. And in fact, what we're doing is the top end and the bottom end of the anterolateral approach. So at the top, we're going between the deltoid and pectoralis major, and at the bottom, we're going initially between brachialis and biceps. You can see we come down onto bone. Distally, you have to split brachialis. And then you create this tunnel between the two approaches. The trouble, of course, is that we have these various nervous structures. That's not a problem, is it? That's not a problem. I mean, you can do that. Oh, hang on a minute. There's a fracture here. That's why we're doing it. So the anatomy becomes critically important. Anybody can do this on a plastic model covered with foam. But if you're doing it in reality, you have to be sure that you are sliding along that periosteum. Otherwise, you can run into problems. Open surgical approaches. This is what we like. We can do an open reduction. Carefully, of course, respecting the soft tissues. But we can actually see what's going on. We can palpate landmarks. We don't need image intensifiers to find that. We characteristically use an internervous plane. We use layered dissections. The dangers are much more easily seen. And the best bit of all, when we're in trouble, we can extend. Who here has fixed radius and ulnar fractures? Put your hands up. Okay? Right, those people who fixed radius and ulnar fractures, you did an open approach, yes? Did you find that the fracture was exactly in the middle of your approach? No, it was at one end, wasn't it? You, 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 you felt it, you, you actually measured it, you did everything, but somehow, when you got down there, it wasn't in the middle and you had to extend it one way or the other. And this is perhaps one of the classical indications. We have a forearm fracture. Because the forearm can be thought of as a joint, we want what sort of reduction? Anatomical. We want what sort of stability in this simple fracture? Absolute stability. And therefore, an approach. And here is the classic A.K. Henry approach. Here is the internervous plane that we use. What's an internervous plane? It's a plane between muscles which have different nerve supplies. So you can go as far as you like that way and as far as you like that way, and you will not denervate either muscle. And this is between the brachioradialis supplied by the radial nerve and these other muscles supplied by the median nerve. And this is one of A.K. Henry's greatest contributions to both anatomy and surgery. 
So we go down between brachioradialis and pronated teres. You have to mobilize a few of these arteries. You come down onto the supinator. In the supinator, you have the radial nerve, the a deep uh, posterior interosseous nerve, and you have to take this off, and you then can come down to the bone. Now, I've gone through that in about 10 seconds, and there's no way that I expect you to know that now or be able to do it. And if you talk to any of the guys either with no hair or gray hair or gray hair and a gray beard... They will tell you that when they are doing this operation, they just kind of look it up in a book or an anatomy book before they start. Because this is something that you don't do on an everyday basis. And if you're trying to fix a fracture in the proximal third, it's nice to revise the anatomy of how to detach the supinator muscle without damaging the posterior interosseous nerve. So... We have three types of approaches, percutaneous, minimal access, and open surgery. How do I know what I want to do? And the answer is, you ask yourself these questions, which should now be becoming familiar to you. Reduction technique, direct or indirect, stability absolute or relative, what implants are available to achieve that, what are the soft tissues are like, and then the bits that we never ask ourselves. What by experience? Doctors are very bad at assessing their own experience. We tend to overestimate our skills. So, reduction. If it's a direct reduction, probably you're going to need a formal open approach. An indirect reduction, minimal invasive or percutaneous. If you want it anatomical, probably you're going to do an open approach unless it's a simple fracture pattern or you're an expert. Remember that screw that you was used to reduce the fracture indirectly. That is technically very demanding. Don't start with that. If it's a functional reduction, any approach will do. If you want absolute stability, use open approaches unless you are an expert or you're being taught by an expert because this is very difficult. Imaging. If you don't have imaging, percutaneous and minimal access surgery is not for you and the majority of patients in the world do not have access to imaging. Soft tissues, the worse the soft tissues are, the better is the indication for percutaneous or minimally invasive. And finally, minimally invasive techniques have huge advantages, but they're difficult and have a steep learning curve. So, I hope you now understand that there are three types of surgical approach, percutaneous, minimal access, and open. And I hope you understand that every surgical approach has the same characteristics. Landmarks and incisions, some form of layered dissection, and dangers. And the smaller the incision, the less chance you have of seeing the danger, and the more you'll need for anatomy to do that. So thank you very much for your attention.